Hi everybody, I'm Scott Stanchfield and we're going to talk about three different patterns today, template method, strategy, and null object. Uh, that's my contact information for my home address and the URL at the bottom there is where I keep the index of all the recorded lectures that I have from this series. This is number five in the series. If you're interested in seeing the other ones, just go to javadude.com slash articles slash patterns. The other ones are linked there. They're all stored on Vimeo. So what I'm going to start off with, just as a really simple example here, is I'm going to use a real uh, a binary tree data structure, just plain old basic binary tree. I want to make sure that I note this is not part of the template method strategy or null object pattern. I'm just using it as kind of a convenient data structure to work with. Uh, basically, if you, how many people here are familiar with binary trees? Okay, so I mean, it, it's, it's pretty familiar. I'll just go over real quick again, just to, it's a quick refresher. Recursive data structure, each node holds data and points to two child subtrees, which is where the recursion comes in there. So for example, we might have a node up here 42 and it has this subtree over here and this subtree here. This subtree has a node 10 with two subtrees and so on and so on. Um, the basic idea with a sorted binary tree is that all the data on the left is less than the current node. All the data on the right is greater than or equal to my current data. Uh, so it's nice for sorting things and things like that. To walk the binary tree, we have a fairly simple algorithm, but it, there's a little bit of complexity to it, not too much. And it's recursive, just because the tree structure is recursive. Uh, we're going to be concentrating mostly on an in-order traversal. And basic idea of in-order traversal is deal with all my children on the left, then deal with me, then deal with all my children on the right. And each of those deal with left and right children work on subtrees, so it's recursive. We can also do pre-order traversals, post-order traversals, very, very similar, except you just move where the deal with me actually happens. I'm going to show this as a quick example just to have this data structure up and running. So we'll see inside here, I have the definition of my binary tree node. Can everybody read that font? Is that okay? And I have some data. I'm just storing integers. I have a left and right pointers to people of myself. I have a little insert, which basically says if I'm less than, if I don't have a left, insert on the left. If I do have a left, go ahead and ask that subtree to do the insert, similar for the right. I have a getter for the data. And here I'm going to have a little walking algorithm. I'm putting this inside the, the data structure itself for the time being. This allows anybody on the outside of the data structure to ask a node to print itself in order. And it could be any subtree of the tree that you want to start with, but it'll only print that subtree. Basic idea, this is the deal with the left, this is the deal with the right, and this is the deal with me. The deal with the left says if I have a left, just recursively call an order. Deal with me is just printing data for now. Deal with the right is if I have a right, do an in-order traversal on it as well. So fairly simple little binary tree guy there. The application for it, and after I got several steps into this, I noticed that I actually repeated node 42. I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention this morning. Uh, and so this is just how you might insert to. You create a node, and then you just do all your inserts. It creates all the binary tree nodes for you. You're in grid shape. We run the in-order traversal, and it should print the result. Let's just make sure that that works OK. And here we have our values in order including the double 42. So it looks like that all worked. So that's just kind of a nice starting point for something that has an algorithm in it. And it's a, it's a non-trivial algorithm, although it's not a difficult algorithm. So what I want to talk about to start with here is the idea of internal walking versus external walking. What we did in this last example was an internal iterator or an internal walk. The how to walk and what to do is buried inside the data structure itself. That hides any of the structural details so the outside world doesn't have to know how to actually manipulate the tree node. Uh, but it results in just having a single way to do the walk. You can't modify it. And that's where I have a big problem, is a lot of the ideas where you know, people will say, oh, all the operations should be inside the object. If you're doing simulation, I completely agree. For a simulation, if you're trying to simulate a real-world object, you want to have each of those objects do exactly what it does in the real world. But when you're doing programs like this, or programs which are probably, I don't know, 98% of programs that people write nowadays, it's not simulation. We should be doing things that make data manipulation easy. And I like to, to separate out my data from my operations on the data quite a bit more. 
So what we can do is move to an external walk. So the algorithm is on the outside. Now in order to do that, you have to expose some of your structural details. In particular, the left and the right have to be accessible. So we have to add getters for the get left and get right. Um, but this allows you to change your walk in any way you want to. You could walk it to print. You could walk it to create a sum. You could walk it to create an average. You could walk it for any number of things. The terms internal and external iterators tend to refer to these. I'm not going to concentrate on using the word iterator too much. We're going to talk about that pattern, I believe, next week or next month. So moving into this situation, what I'm doing with my binary tree node is I've added in this get left and this get right. In my application, I'm putting the in order traversal in the application. I've moved it out of the actual node. So in the application, it's a little bit different. He takes in the binary tree node as an argument, and he does the exact same kind of check. If the node has a left, call in order on the left node. Deal with the node itself. If the node has a right, call in order on the right tree. Make sense so far? So we've just moved to an external iterator. Now, what if we want different effects rather than just printing out what's going on? There's a couple different ways we can do this. You know, the customer might come to us and say, I've got some new requirements for you. Then they come back and they change their mind. And I've got more requirements. And then they come back and they change their mind again. And you know how that is, right? They keep changing and changing and changing. Well, if I had to go into that program and change that same method over and over and over again, what's going to happen? What's likely? Something's going to break, right? It's like I could have something that's working perfectly fine, but if I'm constantly changing it, I'm, I could introduce some bugs. So what I want to do is try to come up with ways of moving into uh, different effects without breaking things. So let's take a look at what some of these different effects might look like. But binary tree node stays exactly the same. He hasn't changed. But my application in this particular case, I've added in three separate methods now or actually two separate methods, print in order and sum in order, to simulate different effects. Okay, So it's a little bit better than modifying the same in order method over and over again. But now I've got these different methods I have to deal with. And you notice the repeat repeated code inside here? They look very, very, very similar. We want to try to avoid that. Do not repeat yourself as a you know common mantra in programming. Uh, the less, that, less code that you repeat, the better chance when you fix something, you fix it in all the places, right? If I noticed a bug up here and changed it, I might forget to change it down here. So what we want to try to do is look for the common algorithm and see what it is. Now, the common algorithm in this example is deal with my left. Oops. Deal with my left, deal with me, deal with my right. And it's the same algorithm in all cases there. What we want to try to do is look for the parts of those algorithms that are replaceable. That's the deal with me part. The deal with my right and left stay exactly the same every time. We just recursively call. So what we can do to factor this out is let's take this functionality and encapsulate it in a class. What we're going to do is have the replaceable part be, um, whoops, I should have said, uh, if, if we're, oh, uh, these are general, general ideas. There's two general ways we can deal with the change in functionality. One is if we want to think about overriding the replaceable part, we use something called the template method pattern, which we're going to see in a moment. If we want to pass in the part that changes, that's a strategy pattern. So we're going to start with template method. And the idea is that we're going to have one class that contains the actual algorithm. And he has some abstract methods that represent the replaceable parts. And then we subclass it for each specific way we want to deal with things. So the template method itself represents our common algorithm. The replaceable parts are what we call hook methods. The hook methods are typically abstract, but they don't have to be. You might have a reasonable default for them. So let's take a look at, first of all, the idea of a walker. This walker is my class representing the algorithm. So the walker has inside of it this in-order method. This is my template method. It has the basic algorithm in it. So you'll notice I have the exact same code for deal with to the, the left and deal with to the right, right? But what I did here is the deal with me part I factored out into a method. And I made that method abstract here. 
So at this level, I'm just generally describing what the algorithm does and not how it actually does the job. I'm going to subclass it for the specifics of how to deal with things. So if we take a look at our print walker, what I do with him is I extend my walker class and override that deal with me chunk. So here's the specifics for how I want to deal with it for printing. Boom, print it. That was, that was terribly difficult, right? And if I look at a sum walker, this guy, he can have a little bit of data inside of him to keep track of things. His deal with me just adds. And then I provide this get sum method so somebody can ask him what's the, the total value at the end of that. So I'm using both of these subclasses to walk. They don't need to know the specifics. The superclass takes care of the specifics of the walking the tree. Oh, I also did one for an average. Very, very similar here where we have a sum and a count instead. So now this version of the application creates my tree. And then to do my in-order traversal, I'm going to create my print walker and call an order on him. To do my average, I'm going to create an average walker and call in order on him. And to do my sum, I'm going to create a sum walker and do an in order on him. Let's run that to see how it goes. So see here, I've printed it out. My average is 45. My sum is 321. So it's a fairly nice way to take that algorithm and factor it out so that you don't have to have repeated code. If you need to make changes, you can make it in one place. Questions so far? Now, there's some issues with this. First of all, you have to have a new subclass for every tweak you want. I'm not too keen on that idea. But it gets a little bit worse than that. You have to have a new subclass for every combination of tweaks. In this example, we only had one hook method, right? Let's say we had three hook methods. And maybe you have three ways of doing each of those three hook methods. You'd have to have nine subclasses to have all possible combinations of those, those different hooks and the different ways you're doing the hooks. That gets a little bit expensive. And it also gets kind of redundant because you're going to have very similar code in a lot of those subclasses. So maybe, for example, we might want to add in two more methods. Do something before we do any traversal and do something after. Think about things like maybe doing some locking or starting a transaction or doing some logging. You might want to do that when you start your method each time. The other problem we get is you cannot change what actions are happening with the same walker. Every, when you make that walker instance, you're locked into it. You can't change it at runtime. So we can come up with some way to deal with this a little bit smarter. We do that by going to the strategy pattern. The idea is instead of having subclasses to override, we take that functionality and we lock it up in a little object by itself and just pass it in. So you can pass in any combination of these guys that you want to do the job. You can mix and match them. You can change them dynamically at runtime. So you get some very neat effects out of this. So if we start, take a look at an idea of a node strategy. This is a class that I, or an interface that I designed here just to say, here is what I'm going to def describe as the deal with me stuff. Anybody can implement it. And I'm going to take somebody who implements this and pass it into a walker. So here's a definition of a walker that might look like that. This walker has three strategies being passed in. A pre-order, post-order, and in-order strategy. I'm passing those in by using these setters here for set pre, set post, and set in. And then my algorithm looks kind of like this. Here's my hook call for before, then deal with my left. Here's my hook call to deal with me, deal with my right. And then here's my hook call to deal with uh, stuff afterwards. Make sense? Now this allows us to mix and match any combination of things. Now note that I can leave some of them null. Right now they, d they start off as null. And if they're null, nothing happens up here. So in my application, I'm going to create a little node printer implementation. I'm going to reuse that node printer like crazy here, just depending on when I want to print things. So I define my, my root, define my walker, define my node printer, and then I'm going to plug in that node printer depending on where I want the, the walk to actually affect pre, post, or, or in. So if I want to do a pre-order traversal, I plug them in at pre-order. If I want to do an in-order, 
I'm going to blank out that pre-order and uh, use him for in-order. And if I want to do post-order, blank out the in-order and set my post-order. So let's see what happens when we run this. So here's my results. The pre-order, if we remember what happened on the insert, the 42 was the first thing printed. So we're going we're gonna to print out that. Then we're going to print out his two children and then the children of those children. So we're kind of working our way down the tree. Where's that tree? So we're going to start with print him, then we're going to print his kids, then we're going to print their kids. My in order, same as before. My post order, you notice it looks like pretty similar, well not exactly the opposite of the pre-order, but we're going to print out the four first. So we're going to come down here and then before we come back up we're going to print our four. Before we come back up we're going to print our ten and so on. Well we print the 31. So print the four, print the 31, then the ten. So he's the last thing printed. So it gives us different ways of kind of plugging in functionality. And you can imagine instead of just printing things, we might have put logging statements or starting transactions or things like that around those methods. So let's go to the next step here. So now what I'm doing I think I just changed the app. Yeah, so another thing we could do with the app is instead of using that explicit inner class, we could use a Lambda. Now, if you're not familiar with Lambdas in Java, if you go to javadude.com slash articles, I have a talk on Lambdas in there as well. So what I've done here is change these to use Lambdas. So I'm saying set pre-order to that Lambda there, take in a node, print it out, and do the same type of thing in each spot. So this is a little bit more readable than using that inner class, a little less code to deal with. Does the exact same thing though. Okay, so what did I change in this one? Oh, I, this this one actually I had it had the uh, actions that are going here print out something a little different, or did I? Ah, so I added in this guy at the bottom here. So this is an example of what it might look like to do the locking. I'm just going to print out that I'm starting to lock something. I'm going to print out that I'm going to unlock something. And so if I run that. We'll see that I'm locking a subtree, locking a subtree, locking a subtree, then I go to the four. So it says he's moving down. He's locking these subtrees, then does the four, the unlocks it, moves up, locks the next subtree, moves down, and so on. So this might give you an example of if you needed to do some kind of locking, you could do something like that this way. Now, one of the things that's kind of annoying in this is we take a look at this walker, check out all those null checks. How many programs have you written where all over the place. You have if x is not equal to null, do something. If x is not equal to null, do something. If x is not equal to null. All over the place. There comes a point when it's really easy to miss one of them. Now, some, if you only have a couple places, it's not too bad. But if you've got like 15, 20 places where you're checking is x null, do something. Is x null, do something. That can be very error prone. So what we might want to do is try to find a way to make sure that that's never a problem. These null checks are always checking, do we have a strategy? If we can come in here and say, we always have a strategy, regardless, we're going to be in much better shape. So we take this and set it up so that the uh, always having a strategy allows us to just say, do it. I don't care what you do or how you do it, just do it. Allow me to call you. And so what we do is we just do nothing inside one of these null strategies. And our two options become, we have a real strategy passed in or a null object being passed in. And a null object is just an implementation of an interface that doesn't do anything. 
Now, the definition of doesn't do anything varies depending on what your methods are trying to do. In the methods that we have in here so far, these, you know, do something with me methods, each of those methods, we're just going to have no code in them. But what if the method returns a value? Then you have to deal with what is an appropriate default value to return. Quite often it's false or zero or null, but that might not be the case. You may have to look carefully at how this strategy is being used in your code to define what a good value is. But most often it's going to be a null or a false or a zero. So let's take a look at this guy. So here I've defined a null object for my strategy. He implements node strategy and the deal with me simply does nothing. Couldn't get a whole lot easier than that, right? Then in my walker, oops, I want walker three. In my walker, I'm going to define an instance of him. I'm making it static because this is what, something I can actually reuse. Because there's no state in that object, I can use the same one over and over and over again. doesn't hurt anybody. I'm going to assign that as the initial value for each of these objects. But then what I need to do is anytime somebody sets it, I need to make sure that they're not going to set it to null. Instead of getting a null, I want to set it to this null node strategy. So I do this by creating this little null fix method here. I could have put this code directly inside all three of these methods, but then that's do not repeat yourself territory. So the null fix says I have a null strategy. If it's null, just use the null node strategy object. Otherwise, if it's not null, use it as is. And then in each of these setters, I just said do a null fix before I assign it. And by doing this, I'm guaranteed that none of these three guys will ever be null. Because I manage them. I made them private. And that's very important. If you make them non-private, all bets are off, right? Somebody can just reach in and pick your pocket. So now in my walk, I can just drop those null checks. If I accidentally left a null check or accidentally put a null check, it doesn't hurt me, right? But in this particular case, it'd be better to accidentally have a null check than to forget one in the previous case, right? Because if you forget one in the previous case, you won't catch it till runtime. So if I run this version, this guy here is just using Walker 3. All the code is the same for the rest of it. I'll see everything works just exactly the same as before. So let's look at a more realistic example of what you might use something like a template method for. File closing is something I've been using this for for many, many years now. Uh, basically, closing a file is ridiculously hard. It may sound easy, like file.close, right? But no, 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 no. There's a lot more to it. And the problem is most of the examples you find online do it wrong. And they don't go far enough on it. In Java 7, they made this easier by adding in try with resources. So you can just, in your try, at the top of your try, you put parentheses, set up your, your different uh, uh, file streams, and then the body of your try gets executed using those, and they're automatically closed, which is great. But that doesn't always work on Android. So if you're doing any Android development, you have to have your minimum API set to at least KitKat. And a lot of people still like to, to go for Jelly Bean or maybe even Ice Cream Sandwich as their earlier versions of, of Android. So you can't run Try With Resources on there. So there's, there's an app I'm working on that actually two days ago, I had an issue where I was trying to switch to try with resources and it came up and said, sorry, you know, you're, you're targeting version 18 of the API, you can't use this. So I went back to my little template method way. So doing it before Java 7 or in Android before 19, you can use a template method for it. And there's a really nice structure for it. So let me walk through the, the how you set up file closing. First of all, we're going to start off with a really bad way to do it. Okay. Now, this is very, very bad. Can anyone tell me why this is bad? So if I throw an exception, I don't actually close the file here. So this print writer here, that close will never get called if anything in the body of this loop actually failed. So that's a big problem. We want to avoid that. So what we're going to do first of all is fix that issue.
And we do that by moving that close to a finally block. So that's a little that's a little teeny bit better. But we have a little bit of a problem here. What if that uh, PW close fails? Now, what these closes do, in this case, PW is a print writer. He's a decorator, which we're going to talk about in a further class. He just wraps around the file writer. And when he's asked to close, he marks himself as closed and closes the thing that he's wrapping. So he would close the file writer for us, which then in turn closes the actual file on the disk. Well, if for some reason this were to fail, the file writer isn't going to get closed. So I want to try to close that as well. So I throw in a little bit more logic here. So I start off by trying to close the print writer. If it's a problem, I report it somehow. Then if the file writer is there, I try closing him. Now a little note about the closable interface in Java. The closable interface has in its contract that it's okay to call close multiple times on something. So in this particular case, if this pw.close uh, succeeded, it would have called fw.close for me. So having it this way is perfectly fine. I could, if I wanted to, add in fw equals null here to prevent it from even hitting that next block. And then once the close works for that, I don't even try this bottom part. But either way, it's okay. Okay, so far so good, but still not good enough. What happens if we get an exception in that finally block? Let's think about this for a minute. When Java throws an exception, the only exception that's kept is the last one thrown. So if we get an exception thrown in my try block up here, and then drop into the finally after that, close these guys, and the closes fail, the exception for the close is going to be the one reported to the outside world. Which exception is more important from the outside world's point of view? The exception that happened when we're actually doing something or the exception that happened when we're cleaning up? Hopefully the way I worded that makes it obvious, right? We really care about what happened inside here. That's our most important thing. Now, if nothing happened in there, it's perfectly fine to report the close error, right? But the one we really care about is in here. So we got to deal with that somehow. And things get uglier and uglier and uglier. So what we do is keep track of which exception is currently pending. And then we go into our try block. And if we have anything thrown in there, we just hold on to it. We don't report it. We don't do anything. We just strictly hold on to it at that level. Then in our finally block, when we're doing our closes, we say, if there's nothing pending, yeah, keep track of the exception I just had. That's fine. Similar for this one here. If there's an exception thrown, if there's nothing pending, keep track of it. And finally, at the end of our finally, if there's something pending, throw it. Boom. Out it goes. Now, that's a little bit gross at the bottom here. Personally, I hate checked exceptions. I think they're like the, the biggest abomination they could have put inside Java because they make you declare throws all over the place. They make you catch explicit things. There's a lot of times when you just want to propagate something and you really don't care. But if you have a checked exception, you have to explicitly catch it, and that's really annoying, or throw it, declare it thrown. So I like to, to make sure that what's coming out is an unchecked exception. And the unchecked exceptions are either runtime exception and its subclasses or error and its subclasses. Anything else is a checked exception. So this is a little bit heavy-handed, though, because I could be wrapping an unchecked exception. So I could have a runtime exception wrapping a runtime exception, which is kind of gross. So I could take it a half a step further and make my pending check look like this. If there's a pending one, if it's a runtime exception, just cast it and throw it, because that's unchecked. If it's an error, just cast it and throw it because that's unchecked. Otherwise, wrap it. And then that way, on the outside of this, note I don't need a throws clause on this. It's much easier to deal with. So this 
is how you deal with closing a file. Now, is that gross or what? You have to do that every single time. Now, where's the code we actually care about here? In the try block. These four lines here are really the only thing we care about in this whole mess. Everything else is boilerplate, right? Now, if you ever find yourself where you have a lot of boilerplate like this and a little bit of, of important code, this is a perfect place to start thinking template method. We can factor out that little blob there into a hook method. The rest of it becomes my template method. So if we do that, then things get really interesting. So I'm going to start off by defining a class I call autocloser. Autocloser is going to be one of these template method uh, class that has a template method inside of it. He has a hook that subclasses will override. And I chose subclasses in this case instead of strategies because I want to have some helper methods that the subclasses can call. In this particular case, this autoclose method. So what I want to have happen is when the subclass overrides do work, anytime he wants to track a file to close, he simply wraps it in a call to autoclose. Oops. He wraps it in a call to autoclose. This will just add it to this list of closables that I'm keeping track of so that when I'm done doing my whole template boilerplate, I can walk through the closables and close them all. Note that I'm adding in reverse order here. And the reason for that is that I want to close things in the opposite order that I opened them. So if I end up wrapping things, I want to make sure that I close the wrapper first before I try to close the thing that it's wrapping. Otherwise, what will happen is, let's say they have that print stream wrapped around my uh, uh, actual file writer. If the print stream is caching anything, if he's buffering anything, if we close the file first, the buffered data will never get written. So you always want to make sure you close from the outside first, which is why I'm going reverse. The templating here with the t-extends closable makes sure that the parameter is a closable to start with, but then also lets us, when we say auto-close, we can assign it without having to cast. If I just said it returns a closable, I'd have to cast every time, which would be really annoying. So here is where the fun starts. This is my template method. Note that I'm using the constructor for the template method here. Rather than having a separate method to call, which I could have done, I'm just saying, hey, why not use the constructor? The constructor can call things. So I'll just create a new auto closer, passing in the method, and boom, it'll do all the work for me. There's my throwable. Here's my hook call in my try block. The catch looks the same. The finally looks, if you take a look at this block here versus what we had, what we had before was a bunch of these, one for each guy we wanted to close, right? So I just put that in my little for loop here to walk through and close each of them, do the pending thing if needed, and then that pending block is exactly the same as what I had before. Boom. So there is my template method, which happens to be a constructor, my hook method, and a little class that's going to be really helpful for me. So now here's my new file closing app. Here's the work that I care about, right? So what I'm doing is I'm saying, create a new auto closer, and here's what I'm doing my work for. Inside there, boom. Create my file writer, wrap it in auto close. Create my print writer, wrap it in auto close. Do my work. And so now we can see that the actual things I care about are the most visible things in that block. Make sense? Pretty neat, huh? Now the other thing we're doing down here, this is just another example of instead of having this extra, P, uh, this extra FW variable, I'm just going to go ahead and nest them this way. So I can say pw equals auto close new print writer who wraps around a file writer that's been auto closed. So now I take care of all that and I only need the one variable now. For contrast in Java 7, here's what the try with resources looks like. And I, I for the life of me, I can't figure out a formatting style here I like. Just with the way these this, this paren and this curly work here, I just can't find something that feels right to me yet. At some point, maybe something will hit me. 
kind of like you'll see up here, this curly, curly paren semicolon abomination. That's a style that I eventually settled on for anonymous inner classes. Any guess why I went with that style? It's ugly, isn't it? When you're looking at the code, it pops out, right? It kind of stops you for a second. Makes a great stopping point for an anonymous inner, an anonymous inner class. Sometimes, depending on how you have your code written, anonymous inner classes can be very... Ah, stop floating. Anonymous inner classes can be very difficult to see. This gives you a nice visual stopping point if there's a single method inside that anonymous class. Okay, so, and I think I'm going to try to work up one of these using a, a lambda type approach, so it'll be even a little bit more, a little bit cleaner than this, um, but I didn't have time this morning to think through it. So in Java 7, we have our try. Here's our resource setup. Note that in order to get something closed, you need to have an explicit variable for it. So you can't do this kind of nesting like this and have it actually close each one. And then here's my actual body, the stuff that I'm doing. But I need to also have a, a catch on here to deal with that. Now these guys here, I really should have some kind of catch around them because they can throw the runtime exception from inside. But this has simplified things quite a bit just by using a template method. And once you get used to seeing this pattern, it becomes pretty easy because it's the exact same thing you write every time. So instead of writing that huge blob of code every time, you only write those two lines and that line as boilerplate. Everything else inside here is what you care about. Make sense? So that's a real life example of how a, uh, a template method might be used. And this is one that I, I've been using for the past, I'm going to say 10 years now. Yeah, it's been about 10 years. I used it at my previous company. I came up with the idea and I, it's, it's in so much code right now. It saved me so much hassle. And I've gotten a lot of pe other people to use it too. Um, I would strongly recommend you use something like this or the try with resources if you can. Um, if you know everybody should be using it very least Java 7 right now hopefully Java 8 can depend on different type of sponsors some sponsors put in hard requirements on you have to use certain versions so there's still some projects that may still be using Java 6 I hope not but it happens um, but Android is a bigger concern right now on this where you, you can't use the try with resources until you're at least in KitKat um, but you know if that's not an issue try with resources is a good place to go there and it basically does the same thing behind the scenes. It's almost identical behind the scenes. They've actually enhanced their exceptions to keep track of um, uh, a different type of pending exceptions. So you can actually have a list of exceptions that happened inside. So you wouldn't have just the last exception that was thrown. You have other exceptions that may have happened along the way. So it's a little bit more productive that way. Okay, any questions on any of that? Okay, so that's all I had for template method strategy and null object. Um, next week, it'll or ne ne next week, next month, it'll be iterator and composite, and then after that, it'll be visitor. And uh, if you're interested in visitor, definitely go to the composite talk first because I'm going to leverage that heavily to show you how to get into visitor because visitor is a very very hard pattern to talk about, and it's a very hard pattern just to get. And I found a way to kind of talk into it that seems to work really well, but you have to go through the composite pattern to get there. Um, so any questions on anything? Okay, I'll be announcing shortly when I, uh, po when I post the video. So I've just got to go render the video and then put it on the website. Um, and then I'll post it and everybody can take a look. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, hope to see you next month.